Heavenly Father, thank you very much for this time to get together and gather with your children that you've drug out from all the four corners of the earth. And we ask that you would be with us tonight and give us wisdom and understanding into the things that you're going to teach us through your word. And we'd ask for the faith to believe those things and the ability to do all that you teach us. Be with all those that you're causing trials with, which is all of us, and give us the ability to endure faithfully to the end. In Christ's name, amen. So welcome, everybody. We're here in our Wednesday night study. And um, but what I'm good, um, tonight I'm going to combine two short videos that I did uh, for my YouTube channel, um, How to Love Your Enemies. It was the first one, and the second one was called Life is Fragile. And these are very closely linked together in the scriptures. So as we go through this, you're going to start to see why understanding that life is short and vain and temporal is essential to how you love your enemies. Because when you love this present world, then you hate anybody that disturbs your precious little life in this present world. But when we realize that it's vain and temporal and short and fragile, then you start to value the things of God more and you view these opportunities to love your enemies as an opportunity to glory in God and, and, and love him and be a good witness for it rather than railing against the things that he causes that cause us to lose our lives and cause us great discomfort and pain at times. So here's Matthew 5:44. It says, but I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you. This is, I think, the most impossible command that you can possibly be, be given is love those who actually are going to do you harm. Well, how? How on earth can we possibly keep this command? Well, the only way is that our heart has to be changed. Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10 tells us, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. So where do we get this deceitful and wicked heart from? Well, you're born with it. You didn't choose it, you just have it. It's what you are. And we go through this life of vanity and trials to first discover what is in our heart, and then to be given to cry out for it to be changed then to watch the Lord do it. So don't be surprised when you find out that your heart is deceitful because it is. Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. So how are we going to be changed? The Lord's going to do it to us. And it is through a fiery, difficult, chastening, grinding process. It's not fast. It's not easy. And it's not very pleasant. But it's very effective. And it produces good fruit in time. So we always have to remember the end when you're in the middle of the not so pleasant parts of this. So what do we treasure? What we treasure will determine how we respond when these trials come. Hebrews 10, 34 and 35. For you had compassion on me and my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for heaven for yourselves in heaven. So how are we able to joyfully accept the plundering of our goods. That is not a pleasant thing, especially when you've worked really hard for something for a long time, and then it's just gone or taken or destroyed. You're mad at whoever did it to you, and you're especially mad at God when you realize that he's the one that's causing it. It's That's the most natural thing in the world. We have to be chastened from that in time, of course. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence which has great reward. What confidence? That you have a more enduring possession in heaven for going through all these trials and suffering all these things. It's not for no reason. It's not vanity. The vanity is the temporary, but what it's producing in you is not vanity. It'll last forever. 
Matthew 6, 19 to 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So when you're really angry and hating someone for whatever's happening, it's showing us what's in our heart at that point in time. We must come to see the vanity of life and how short it is. Ecclesiastes 1, 2, and 3. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit has a man for all his labor in which he toils under the sun? This is Ecclesiastes 2.18. Then I hated all my labor which I had toiled under the sun, because I leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will rule over all my labor which I toiled, in which I have shown myself wise under the sun. This also is vanity. What, what is also essential to overcoming this is faith. If you don't believe that God's going to provide you for you and protect you, and that he is the one that has actually sent this evil, then part of your anger comes from being scared. You think, well, what else are they going to take from me? And if they take this from me, how am I going to survive? But that, that's a fearful response, not knowing that the Lord is going to protect us. And I'm not making light of this. I mean, these are difficult, take you to your wits end experiences, and it is not going to feel pleasant. I mean, I went through this very personally. I had a bad back surgery in 08 that maimed me and partially crippled me for a decade of chronic pain. So I'm not saying this ignorantly. I mean, I've had someone take what arguably is the most valuable thing you have in the flesh is your health. And because without that, what else can you do? But the Lord gave me to see that, you know, that's what I needed. And he caused that. And who am I to fight with him? You know, and I got a better reward for it. So not making light of your trials. I'm just helping you understand why they're here. Ecclesiastes 2, 18 and 19. Oh, we already read that. James 4, 14. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Appears for a little time. It doesn't feel like a little time when you're living... 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 years when you're in the middle of it. But when you look back, it's it's very short. Ecclesiastes 9, 11 to 12. I returned and saw to the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. For man also does not know his time, like fish taken in a cruel net, like birds caught in a snare. So the sons of men are snared in an evil time when it falls suddenly upon them. So when we're going through life, you tend to think, well, if I'm just strong enough or smart enough or do enough, then I'm going to be able to avoid all these trials and crush all my enemies and I can just have what I want in the flesh. And the Lord's like, No, no. (laughs) You can do everything right. The analogy I was given years ago is you're a farmer. You plant the perfect field. You keep the weeds out. You do everything you're supposed to do. And here comes a big hurricane, tornado that just roots everything up and destroys it. You're a bad farmer? No. The Lord just sent a tornado or hail on your land. And life's the same way. You can be doing everything right, and he just sends you an enemy to steal from you. He just sends you health problems to... You know, cause you trouble. And why does the Lord do that? Because he wants us to value the things of the spirit, not the things of the flesh. And if he makes it go too well for us all the time, what are you going to value? You're going to value the flesh. And we do not know our time. We do not know when these things will come upon us. All we know is the Lord will give us enough to make it through. And that's our promise. Neither riches nor poverty. Yet what we do in this physical life is very important. Luke 16, 11, Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? So even knowing that enemies are going to steal, things are going to happen, hailstorms are going to come, your first response is, well, I just don't want to do anything then. 
I'm just going to go hide in my old hole and, you know, try to avoid trouble in life. And the Lord's like, you can't do that. You need to go be faithful with what I've given you. You can't bury your talent in the earth. You can't avoid the world because you're going to have enemies in the world. You have to go out there so you can go love your enemies. And that's not natural, especially as your knowledge increases and your sorrow increases. Because with much knowledge and much sorrow, that really makes you want to retract from everything. Because you start seeing the evil that's lying behind everything. And you tend to swing to the other extreme and just cast everything off. And that's not... It's not prudent, it's not wise, and it's not how you're salt and light in the world. Proverbs 12, 27, The slothful roasts not his hunting, and the wealth of a diligent man is precious. Both your physical and your spiritual things, you should value what you have. If you've got a job, treasure it and do a good job. you got a family, care for them, take care of them. If you have possessions, do that. But know that they're for the purpose of glorifying God, and he can take anything whenever he wants. It, it is an impossibly narrow way that the flesh cannot do and the carnal mind cannot do, and you only learn this through a process. We must be diligent in all matters of this life, diligent in business to honor our parents, provide for our families, yet also to hate them and even hate our own lives. Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my Disciple. Matthew 10, 36 and 37. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So there it explains it. How do you hate your father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters? But you're supposed to provide for them and honor them. Well, he says it here in Matthew 10, 37. He who loves them more than me. You can't love their flesh. You have to love the spirit of God and the truth of God above all else to the point where you will tell your family, your friends, anybody, I, I can't go along with that, right? And you're going to be accused of <laughs> not being loving and you don't care about us. And it's like, you don't know how much I do care about you because love is to keep his commandments. And I love you. I'm going to do what's right, even when it's hard. So how do we love our enemies? By hating them. Romans 12, 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. We have to hate the deeds of the flesh and of the carnal mind. We must hate this in ourselves first, and then we can properly hate it in those around us. Yet in our carnality, we'll hate everyone around us before we can see that we are the beast as well. So everything has a positive and a negative. There is a right way to hate evil, and there's a wrong way to do it. It's not our job to take vengeance. It's our job to keep the commands and do what the, the Lord says. What also makes this doubly hard is it's one thing when people do evil to you or things happen and you suffer. It's another when things happen to you and it affects others around you, it affects your family, it affects your friends. That can make you want to take vengeance and say, Lord, I can deal with it when it just impacts me. But when it starts affecting my family and the other people, now I'm mad. Now I want vengeance. But that's, that's not true either. The reason those things happen is the Lord wants everybody to have enemies. He, you have to have them if you're going to learn to love them. You have to lose things if you're going to learn to not value things of the flesh. So don't be surprised when he causes evil to you that affects people you love. Right? And your job is to be the example and to say, I know this is affecting you. I know this is making you suffer. But God has done this for a reason. And then in their time, they'll turn on you because you don't take vengeance. They'll say, you should be go getting vengeance for this evil done to us. And you say, I can't do that. That's the Lord's job. Matthew 7, 5. Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So we always have to deal with ourselves first before we can deal with others. We are each a hypocrite before we can become like Christ and truly love our enemies. Here's 1 Peter 2.23, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. 
So how was Christ able to not revile in return, take vengeance? He committed himself to God the Father who judges righteously. So when these evil things happen to us, you're, you're supposed to hate evil. Like it's perfectly fine to say what you just did to me was very evil. But you don't go and take vengeance. You say, Lord, you did this and you're in charge of them and you will teach them in their time, whatever you see fit to do. That's how you do it. Matthew 16, 21 to 23. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. But what Peter did was perfectly normal. You know, Lord, you've done nothing wrong. Why are you going to let them kill you? Why are you going to go do that? This doesn't make any sense to me. And Christ pointed out to him. He was thinking according to the flesh. He was minding the things of men. He was trying to preserve flesh. And Christ said, that's not what I'm after. I'm minding the things of God. He, Christ knew this life was temporary and vain and that his sacrifice was going to eventually lead to the salvation of all. And it was only Satan working through Peter that he brought that correction to Christ and Christ would have none of it. And we're going to go through the exact same thing. People are going to try to compel us to protect our flesh and take vengeance. And we have to say, no, put your sword away. We're not, that's not what I'm here to do. So right after Christ says this to Peter, get behind me, Satan, for trying to stop him from going to the cross. Verse 24 to 26. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So Christ is explaining, this is what it's going to take to be a disciple. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow me. Be willing to lose whatever it is you need to lose. Because when you have that attitude, the Lord will provide what you need. He's not going to let us go destitute. He, he's going to provide for it. But he sure is going to make you think you're going to lose more than you need, right? He, you're going to feel those thoughts in your head. They're going to come. And your mind is going to race. And you're going to say, if I don't protect myself, this is going to end up really bad. Now, Christ did at the right time flee evil. There's nothing wrong with running away from it. That's very different than seeking vengeance on it and trying to write it yourself. This is Philippians 1, 21 to 26. For to me, this is Paul writing to the Philippians, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell. What Paul's saying is, it is harder for me to live this life than it is to just say, Lord, take me home. Because he knew what lay up for him in the resurrection. Every tear is wiped away. All the pain is gone. It's over. So to stay in this life is being drugged to Christ as a sacrifice for your brethren. Because we'd rather just, <laughs> we know the better things at the end. Let's just get it over with, right? Why suffer anymore? But if I live on in my flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I'm hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to, to depart to be with Christ, which is far better. That's the reward. Who wouldn't want it now? Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. That your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. So what is Paul's motivation to stay here? It's the joy of the brethren. It's serving other people. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. So if you don't have a mindset of service for others, the more you come to realize the vanity of this life, you're going to become very depressed because it's depressing and it's saddening when you see how evil it is. 
But when you're focused on serving others, it gives you purpose and reason and you can continue on. I mean, I, I understand exactly what Paul's saying and I think about this you know, all the time. So how do we comfort one another in these times as we see the vanity manifest and the evil manifest just continually? This is 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. He's talking about the first resurrection, the thing that Paul is longing for. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. What's comforting? There's a good end. Like, if we love our enemies and lay our lives down and say, you know what, if you want it that bad, you can have it. I have a better treasure in heaven. Then you get this. That's what we're hoping for. Comfort one another with this. Because if we don't do that and we cling to our stuff and fight over it and seek vengeance, all we have to look forward to is the lake of fire. And that is not fun. We do not want that. We want to go through it now and get it over with and get on to the reward. And that's how you declare the end from the beginning. That's thinking like God. Think with the end in mind. And then things make sense. Because all this hating your enemies, protecting your stuff thing, it's short-term temporal thinking that is not going to be here anyway. So the other study I did was called, um, it's about the thief in the night, but it's, it, it, was, it was called, um, oh, I forget the title of it. First Thessalonians 5, 2, and 3. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Well, what is the day of the Lord? Well, there's an application where it's the first resurrection, but it's when Christ comes to you to judge in your life whenever it is. You never know when he's going to come and cause things in your life that make you realize it's vanity. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. We know this is coming, however it manifests. There's a big outward application, sure, but it happens every day. You know, you never know going along when something's going to happen that, you know, your comfortable little life is disturbed and you're not happy about it. Sometimes it's just someone insulting you or hurting your pride and sometimes it's taking your stuff. But our reaction in that day of the Lord will tell us where we are in our heart and our mind. And this certainly manifests, I'm in the financial business, so I, I see it in the markets a lot. <laughs> they never tell you, hey, tomorrow's going to be a really bad day. They always say, don't worry, it's okay, things are going to get better, and then bang, here it comes. Every single time. That's how it works. And the, the, it's called the normalcy bias. We are biased in our nature. We want things to remain normal. We want them to continue as they are. And there's scriptures that tell us that. Oh, it's always going to continue as it is. You know, That's just what you think. But the more you know about this world and the more you know about the heart of man, the more you know that the wrath is being stored up more and more every day. And you can never tell when the flood of Noah is going to come, when the Lord finally says, I've had enough. And that has a personal application to us, and it has an application outwardly in the world. He lets us store up our mistakes and our sins to a certain point, And he says, okay, now I'm going to manifest it to you. And it's not going to be pleasant, but you're going to learn. And this flood of truth comes in and you're woeful and sorry and repenting over it and, and you learn. And one day he'll do it to the whole earth because our earth is full of lying and cheating and stealing and greed and everything else. Way more than we even realize. Much knowledge truly is much sorrow. First, First Timothy 6.17 Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty nor trust in uncertain riches but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. You can be rich and not be physically rich, right? Just thinking you're a really good person is rich, right? Having pride in your own abilities or self is being rich. And, and the Lord says, don't trust in that. He gives us all things to enjoy. Enjoy whatever he's given you, but know that it's all of him, by him, through him. 
That's where it all comes from. And then in walking in that obedience is the motivation to be diligent and take care of what's around you and be good to those around you. Proverbs eleven twenty eight: He who trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like foliage. Well, why do the righteous flourish? Because they can handle any circumstance. You learn to rejoice in all things. When you're experiencing loss, you see it as an opportunity to better focus on the riches of heaven. You see it as an opportunity to be a witness to others. Whereas when you love the flesh, all you want to do is complain and throw a fit and find someone to blame, right? Whose fault is this that I lost whatever it is I lost? It's like, the Lord did it. What are you going to do? Sure, look back at your life, see if you can learn something from it. There's always something you can learn from it and do better, but you can't time travel and undo it. So just mm -hmm. accept it and give an account and move on. And some people in your life will not be able to move on. They will hold things against you that were out of your control forever, right? And in those people, what do you do? You just have to love them and be patient with them because how could they think anything else? They're still carnal. It's all they love. It's all they think about. They don't have the riches of heaven. So why wouldn't they hate you? Right? That's what the not being surprised in trials is, is all about. So I pray this will help us all learn to love our enemies and value the things that are above as all of these trials continue to come upon us and many different forms. So that is all for tonight. Anybody wants to make any comments or ask any questions? Crystal. Hi, Crystal, go ahead. Gotta unmute yourself, Crystal. I just want to say thank you, Mitch, for the study. I watched it on one of the short videos, and I even we watched it again on Monday. And it's, it's, it's so true about life is just a vapor. And, you know, that's the same analogy. We, we allowed COVID to sit and, and watch. And, and if it's not every other day or every day when COVID's not having practice and everything, we focus on letting him get those short videos in and just still hear the word and still go back and talk to him about um about victory study and so it really hits home for us you know um with with the with the death of a child but we know that we, he has eternal life in christ and so i just really appreciate how you merge both of those studies together and it was just it, it was very edifying and i just had to say thank you for it well i'm glad it's Edifying, Crystal. You're blessed that it is. <laughs> it is. It's a blessing. Okay. His word we have, it, I mean, it, it gives strength and it gives us comfort. Amen, sister. Amen. Anthony? Hi, Mitch. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um. Thanks for your study. I was thinking about that verse or that metaphor you used at the beginning about the farmer who can, you know, do everything in their own might and power to plant the crops. But um, as you said, you know, God could just send a hurricane or just not send rain. And I was thinking about it. It was a couple of months ago about the, you know, the the glory that we seek as 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 a man, for example, a lot, of, a lot of that is in in sport, for example. So the, the example or the metaphor is, um, you know, we can be the best football player. I know you, you just had your Super Bowl in America. You, you know, you, and that's really what we we desire or our flesh desires, isn't it? Is to be to be worshipped instead of to worship the Creator. We want to worship the the created, worship the flesh. So we can be the best football player or the best quarterback, but you know God could send a massive storm on the night of the Super Bowl, or He could cause a massive earthquake. <laughs> and we're really playing this game a as an illusion. You know, we we think we're in control, we think we're great, we think we're talented, but unless we give all that glory back to Him, He, he 
and just you know pull it pull it out from underneath us and for the purpose of of humbling us humbling the flesh and you know the carnal mind is enmity against God that has to be burnt out of us um, and even the disciples at the time of Jesus's um, crucifixion they you know couldn't accept it couldn't understand it they they fled they just couldn't quite grasp the importance of of you know the spiritual side of things or the unseen side of things um, anyway I just yeah I liked your analogy about the the farmer and yeah really is a humbling experience I guess so that we can see that we are that prodigal son I guess that lo that lost sheep the the, the person in need of repentance. I don't know if that makes sense. Well, yeah, you know, it comes in two phases. At first, we really are lascivious, or not diligent, or we're puffed up and we're arrogant, we're not saying Lord willing. Like, at first, that's who we are, and the Lord sends the judgment to straighten us up. And then, you do say Lord willing, you do all the right things, and you're not doing anything wrong. And he still sends a hurricane. Why? to manifest that Christ is in you and you can take this well. So, because I, I struggle with a long time of when bad things happen, I'm always like, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? Finally, I realize sometimes you're doing nothing wrong. It's just a trial to manifest that you can take it, that Christ is in you. And I, I find that immensely encouraging because people will blame you and try to say, well, it's all your fault and it's this. And it's like, hey, <laughs> The Lord just does things. Life is just vain. It's just, it's suffering. And you're supposed to take it well. We get better and better at enduring and overcoming. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we keep sending them. That's what it is. It's like, it's like you got to pass, you know, whatever it is, high school. And at first you're going to fail it. And he keeps sending you back until you pass it. So expect a trial when you're doing good because then it manifests that you're passing it. Yeah, exactly. And one of my favorite stories in the Bible is when Jesus calms the storm and uh, <laughs> you know, people are terrified. They, they think this is it. Because, I mean, it's scary when, you, when you're out on, on the water and there's high winds. It's a, that's full on. Um, <laughs> was it when Jesus was sleeping and, and he came out and, and calmed the storms? But my favorite verse is when they say, you know, what manner of man is this that he can... That he can calm the storms. I'll, I'll try and find it. I think that was the. <clears throat> but yeah, you're right, Mitch. I mean, it's you know we don't we don't cause the trials. That's you know God working these things out. It's like the verse that says, "Why was this man it's... born blind? His sin or his parents' sin?" And Christ is like, neither, that the glory of God be made manifest. You know, yeah. so comfort yourselves with that, that it's not just because we do wrong. Of course, we suffer for our evil, but we also suffer just for the glory of God. Like, look at Christ. He did nothing wrong ever. And look how much he suffered. Why would we be any different? That's right. So. Yes, it's Matthew eight twenty seven, when Jesus calms the storm. The men were amazed and asked, what manner of man is this? Even the winds and the sea obey him. Yes. We don't know who Christ is at first, but he can calm anything whenever he wants. Amen, Anthony. Appreciate the comments. Um, we're going to go to Lawanda. Hello, good evening. I came in late and, and I heard just what I needed to hear here. <laughs> I heard my trial for today. I mean, I think I think for every six months I spend whining and complaining and wanting things to just stay the same for a longer period of time, which is probably about two weeks for me. I think it's a steady, a steady flow of normalcy. But... Um, Today, uh, I, my heart was just broken. I was totally challenged, and, and um, I just, I just want a smooth ride for a longer time. And 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 in the back of my mind, I, I, I was kicking and I was throwing the tantrum. 
I was about two and a half years old, and um, but I didn't do it. I, I I was influenced by the Babylonians that I um, were interacting with, and I know they're still in the flesh, and they do exactly what you said they do, but for some reason, when you are when you are motivated to be an example, when you are, well, I am motivated to serve. Somehow, somehow Jesus in me woke up, you know, and I didn't throw a fit. And I, and I, and I just spoke to the winds and said, listen, this is what it's going to be, even if it doesn't look like it today as I go out to try and calm the storm. If the storm doesn't calm down, it's still going to be good. And um, I amazed myself. Some people said I inspired them, but I inspired myself. And the same people that said I inspired them inspired me. And that's a beautiful thing. And I don't get it often in life. And I guess we're not supposed to or for whatever reason. But I'll remember it because when I came to, when I came to, to the webinar, and I heard the word, and the word confirmed the, the, the day, and, and that has been a blessing to me. Well, I'm glad to hear the Lord is feeding you day by day, like all of us. Day by day. Day by Manna day. each day. Amen, sister. Joshua? Hey, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right, well... I just wanted to say another great Bible study. And um, one thing that came to mind was the story about Job mm -hmm. and how, you know, being a righteous man, God brought him through all those trials to basically truly test him and show him, you know, that there still was some vile aspect of his flesh still in him to humble him. Mm -hmm. And then kind of paraphrasing this other scripture, um, I didn't have time to look it up because I'm logged in on my phone here. <laughs> but um, it seems the Lord uses trials to basically, you know, prune us so that we can bear more fruit. So he'll let things go good for a while and, you know, um, in order to humble us and not let us get puffed up in the flesh, he'll bring a trial upon us and then it'll prune us and humble us so that we can bear more fruit for him. So that's all I wanted to share there. Amen, brother. That's right. Every tree that bears good fruit it gets pruned, so don't be surprised when we get pruned, right? Right. Aren't the trials fun, though? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No chasing is pleasant for the moment. If they were fun, they he wouldn't call them trials. they call them parties. <laughs> right. He drags us uh, kicking and screaming, right? Yes. And Lord willing, over time, we learn to kick and scream less, because it's, it's like Christ right. in the garden. He's like, he has to ask the question, Lord, is there another way? Can this cup pass from me? No. Right. Okay, your will be I'm, just, I'm just really amazed by Paul's testimony and how you can tell in his letters how he over time started to really have peace in his trials. And no matter, like he says, no matter the circumstance, I've, you know, I find a way to be content with what the Lord has provided me. So I just, I don't know, it's just that really speaks to me and some of the trials we have been going through, my wife and I. So uh, that's all I wanted to share. Amen to that. We go. Let's go to Mike. Mike. Hey, Mike. Hey, Mitch. I had something I wanted to say. And I had it all pulled up and had it waiting on the screen here, and you took it right out of my mouth. So I hope you're happy. <laughs> well, you can give a second witness, Mike. <laughs> Okay, well, I've got the same scriptures that you had, which was uh, John 9, the uh, the man that was uh, born blind. They, they asked him, they said, uh, who, who was, who sinned? You know, because like you said, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? And they, they say, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Well, now, how can you sin before you're even born, you know, to be born blind. Obviously, they had some misconcepts about uh, the, the, the life life before life. Uh, they might have had a law circularity doctrine back in that day, too. No doubt they did. 
But anyway, Jesus says, neither this man has sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God might be made manifest. And of course, he's not saying that they hadn't sinned because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But he's saying that has nothing to do with it. And then he says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. And that is that is what you were saying. Just just work the works of God. Don't worry about you know why the trial came. There's no ex- explanation for our trials. Really, I don't care if we did do something the day before that was wrong. It was still something that God worked because He has all of our days written in His book, and He's working all things after the counsel of His own will, and He makes all things for Himself. Yes, even the wicked for the day of evil, so that it's all of Him. And while we do need to take all the admonitions to heart and examine ourselves and try ourselves, you know, judge ourselves, it's still important, so comforting, just to take knowledge of the fact that he is the one who's working even that when we do examine ourselves. So there, there's your second witness. (laughs) Well, I appreciate it very much. That's a good one. It's nice to be of one mind. That's all I can say. It certainly is. It's a lot lot better than being adversarial, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you why it's so important to know these things and what Mike just explained Mm -hmm. is because you will be blamed and persecuted for things that are out of your control and you didn't do. And you just, you have to know this in your heart or it'll just distress you to no end. And I've, I've been through this and I've beaten myself to death over it. And I'm, I've learned over time to just say, hey, I'm the farmer. I planted the seed and it hailed. And the tornado came. What do you want me to say? You know? Well, I want to say that I sure do appreciate what the Lord is doing with these uh, YouTube things that he's got you doing. I really, I really enjoy them, and I'm looking forward to seeing well, what the Lord is going to do. You need to take a trip to Florida sometime. There's a lot of people down there. Uh, it's, I'm already, uh, it's already brewing. Possibly April. So. All right. All right. So, Lord be willing. All right. Hi, Betty. Hi, Mitch. Uh, I had an example of uh, that verse in Ecclesiastes 9, 11, in the last part of it, but time and chance happens to them all, and that used to disturb me something terrible, because when I had my child to die, somebody told me that. Well, time and chance happens to them all. Well, that was very distressing at the time, because I thought, well, what does God have to do with this, you know? So the answer is in the second and the third verse of that same chapter. Nine, nine, two, and three. Yes. One thing comes alike to all. One event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the clean, to to the unclean. To him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. As is the good, so is the sinner. He who takes an oath is he who fears an oath. This is an there is an evil in all that is done under the sun that one thing happens to all. Truly the heart of the sons of men are full of evil. Madness is in their hearts while they live, and after that they go to the dead. But for him who is joining to all, their living is hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. Yeah, there it is. It, one event happens to all. You all die no matter how righteous you are. You know, what yeah. changes is what happens after that death. Do you wake up to judgment or to um, r- ruling and reigning? And just might as well get it over with. It's going to come now or later. You know, there's no way around it. So, yeah. But I, I mean, that is a, people get confused with that one verse there sometimes as to what it means. Yeah, no, it's true. It's true. I'm glad you brought it up. Because because it's also true that you do reap what you sow, and there is peace and righteousness and obedience. It doesn't mean that you're 
trials are going to stop or your physical circumstances are going to be perfect. It just means you have the grace and the faith to go through them well. And mm -hmm. if you have a good attitude and the right mindset, things that would destroy you before don't. You're able to get through them. Yeah, you have that peace that passes all understanding when you know. Yes. Anyway, that's it. All right. Thank you, Betty. Bobby and Eileen. Can I meet yourself, Bobby and Eileen? I just want to say thank you for the study. It's been a good study. And I just wanted to add the verse that said, um, if we suffer for things that we do, then we deserve it. But when we suffer for Christ, then it, it gives us a joy. So I just want to say thanks for the study. Very welcome. Praise the Lord for giving it to us. I see Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, Mitch. How are you going? Um, we're still here. We're all right. Yeah. Um, that was lovely. Thank you. I just thought, I just, when you were doing the study, you mentioned something at one point about uh, how we're hypocrites because we, um, you know, we see all those things in someone else, but we've got to see them in ourselves first. And um, just that word hypocrite, I've always found fascinating because it means to, um, in the Greek anyhow, it's, um, it means an actor under an assumed character. Which, uh, and in the Old Testament, it, the, the word used is, means story. So I just thought it's interesting that um, with the old man and the new man, that we, we, when we don't even realise it, even when we think that we're righteous, we are actually an actor under an assumed character. It's actually an old man. It's a, it's a, it's someone that we think we are, but we're not. <laughs> it's um, until Christ actually puts the real thing in us. I just thought that was interesting. I appreciate you sharing, Cheryl. No worries. Steve. Yes. <clears throat> uh, thanks, uh, everybody's contribution. And, uh, you know, with the study, you know, you just have actually so much that everybody was saying all kinds of stuff. And it's just all, a lot of good things coming out. But, uh, you know, just mention a couple of things here, Mitch, before I even start what I was going to, you know, uh, like what Mike was saying, you know, he said, we'll do it as a second witness. Well, I just want to bring out another witness to it and, and the whole thing with that for that man uh being born blind is for the glory of god and j just uh, uh another example of that everything that christ did was uh, for the glory of his father this is uh from john 11 this is uh 11 13 and 4. it says therefore his sister sent unto him saying lord behold he whom that you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. And that's what Christ did when he healed the blind man, you know, from he was born blind, Christ healed him. That was for the glory of God to glorify his Son. So the son glorifies the father through him. So I just wanted to add that to what Mike was as another witness to that, Mitch. Well, I always appreciate the second witness of Steve. And it is, it is sobering to realize that the way the father is glorified is through putting to us through trials. And just well, like you, said, know, uh, and, and, you know, you mentioned a lot of things. Like you said, there's a lot of things going on. You know, one of the things that you kind of mentioned, Mitch, is about... Uh, you know, Christ going through what he did, the suffering stuff that he did. But I just wanted to add this error to what Peter tells us, thinking that strange or fiery trial that you go through. So, you know, that's what we're going to do. We're going to go through these fiery trials because that's what we're told. And uh, Christ is our pattern. 
Christ is a pattern that we're following. He chose Paul as a pattern. And as Paul says, be a follower of me as I also am of Christ. So that's what we do. We follow Christ. Everybody follows Christ. And that's what Paul tells us, that he chose him to be a pattern for us. So that's what we do. We follow uh, through, you know, we follow Christ through his word. Anyway, uh, one of the things that I, I was going to just read off some scriptures, Mitch. You know, one of the first scriptures that come to my mind when you were going through a lot of this stuff, you know, with the vanity and things like this here, you know, was James 4.14, you know, and Crystal mentioned it about being a vapor, stuff like that. So I just want to bring out some other scriptures. You know, it, it's the same principle. This is uh, Psalms 103, start with 13. Like as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field. So he flourishes, for the wind passes over and it is gone. The place thereof shall know it no more, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him. And his righteousness unto the children's children, to such as to keep his covenant to those that remember his commandments to do them. And this is uh, from Isaiah 40, start with 6. The voice said, cry, and he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodness thereof is a flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, because the spirit of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. And this is... Uh, from James, for the sun is no sooner, this is James 1.11, for the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withers the grass and the flower therefore falls, and the grace of the fashion of it perishes. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. You know, and one of the things that you, you were discussing is like the, the vanity and as you use the, the scripture, you know, to gain the whole world, but lose your soul. So I'm going to end it with this here, with John 6.63, that we're all familiar with. But I was adding this to Isaiah 48. But the word of our God shall stand forever. It is a spirit that quickens, gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to is the words, their spirit and their life. And that's the word of God, which is our Lord. I end it there, Mitch. Amen, Steve. I appreciate that. Sue? Oh, hi. Thank you so much for the study. It's so good to be on. Um, I remember um, in, in the Bible it talks about lest our, our righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees, we shall know in no wise enter the kingdom. So... It seems kind of silly for us to think that, you know, like we shouldn't forgive our enemies <laughs> because that would be not so good for us. And, and a lot of um, the scriptures talk about, especially in, in, in uh, Matthew, um, well, starting a little bit backwards with Matthew 7, 7, 5, it says, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye. And when we go to the, the beginning of that, that chapter, Matthew 7, it says, judge not that ye be judged, not judged. Because we don't want to judge people because if we're judged, we're going to be judged as sinners because that's what we are. And um, in Matthew 7, 2, it says, for what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And so, you know, I'm just wondering, like, how dare we? And in Matthew 6, 15, um, it, it talks about in, in, in the Holy Word, but if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you. And um, if we go back up into Matthew 5, that, that, that also includes so much in there, but um, uh, 
there's there's just so much you know to to know and to to learn that we just you know it it all involves taking our thoughts captive in 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 Romans and and um, I'm I'm just so exuberant about being in the body so that we can all make our way together to to get up to the point where we can help each other to keep on going by taking our thoughts captive and not holding things against each other and because in in Matthew 5 45 it says that we might be children of of our father which is in heaven and that's that's what we want to do and um even in Matthew 5 30 it talks about that we're going to receive a hundredfold now in this time for for us that have given up our houses, our brethren, our sister, our father, our mother, our wife, our children, or our lands, for for his sake, we're going to get a hundredfold even in this age. So there's so much to look forward to and to look forward to together. And um, I'm just so glad that, that we don't have to do it alone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Amen, Sue. And we're getting there one day at a time, learning to Love our brethren within, first and foremost, because if you can't love your brethren within, how are you going to love the really evil world without? So this, we are in the lake of fire, practicing on one another. So, well, thank you all for coming. I'll unmute everybody and let you all say your goodbyes. And Lord, thank you, Mitch. We'll be back next week. Lord, thank you, Mitch. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank everybody. you. Good night, all. Good night, all. Steve and Marcia, Cheryl, Laura, Ashua. Bye, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night, Anthony and Boyd, Brian, Cameron, Donna. Hey, hey, Mike. Uh, quick question for you. Yeah. Are you, uh, where are you, you're located in Georgia, was it? Yeah, north of Atlanta, about 40 miles, a little town.